It's from Genesis 16, 1 through 16. And in this passage, we enter the story of Hagar, which is situated within the larger story of Abraham and Sarah. At this point, the couple have not received their new names and are still known as Abram and Sarai. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So Abram lived ten years in the land of Canaan. Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man, and with his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his kin." So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy, and it lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. you pray with me, please? God, thank you for your word. We ask that you would minister to our hearts and minds as we spend time with the story of Hagar. And Lord, where our humanity falls short, please breathe your illuminating spirit into this message. In your name we pray, amen. Well, over my years, 17 years, of teaching middle school, it's been interesting to talk with students about their names hear which names they prefer to go by, observe as their peers generate nicknames. I've learned at least five different ways to spell Chloe, all of which were represented in one class of eighth grade students. (laughs) At least I could tell them apart when they put their name on their paper. Um, But names carry significance because they're tied to our identity. It was a powerful thing for me to be able to stand and greet every student by name as they walked in the door. And the looks of surprise and delight as I managed this in the first few days of school always affirmed the importance of this practice. Knowing their names showed them they were seen and valued by me. Names and identity, they're intertwined. And maybe some of you have a, a fun story about the origin of your name or nickname. And if this is you, I would love to hear it. I love these little stories, little dose of happiness. My name, Laura, um, is perhaps predictably from the Little House books by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, When my mother was pregnant with me, she read those stories aloud to my brother, and she came to love the name. But I've also been known as Brady and Sarah's little sister, Bob and Susie's daughter, Annalie's mom, Ms. Fuller, and just Fuller. And each of these represents a different sphere of my life and a different part of my identity. The way we see ourselves is shaped by many voices and experiences. The world wants to tell us who we are, and we are often willing to accept their names and labels and the limitations and exaltations that go along with them. But the world cannot provide our souls with a lasting identity. 
Our parents and guardians are the first to try to give us identity with a name and a family. And our value and understanding of our place in the world is shaped by those early years. Is our name safe in the mouths of those who care for us? Is our home a place of stability and support or chaos and indifference? And our understanding of who we are emerges in that setting of home. When we meet Hagar in scripture, her home is not one we would wish for. She was a slave, her life completely subject to the decisions and whims of her mistress, Sarai. Her story begins in Genesis with an emphasis on her subjugation. In some Jewish writings, Hagar was given to Sarah by Pharaoh as compensation for her time, her time in his household. You may recall the story. Pharaoh had purchased Sarai from Abram as a concubine because Abram was too scared to admit that Sarai was actually his wife. No. However, the biblical account does not give us a specific origin story for Hagar. We simply know that she is Sarai's Egyptian slave required to do her bidding. Even her name recorded in scripture is likely not her actual name. In Hebrew, Hagar means the foreigner or alien or sojourner. Had Hagar been stripped of her original name and called by this degrading title? It's possible. With limited information, though, the author quickly shapes our understanding of Hagar's identity. And what they find significant is that she is female, foreign, and enslaved. In the culture that she lived in, this placed Hagar nearly at the bottom of the social structure. And I wonder how much of this cultural identity Hagar accepted and how much she resisted. I recently heard a, a description of the five people that walk into the room as you enter. Who you want others to think you are. Who others think you are. Who others want you to be. Who you want to be. And who you think you really are. And to that five, I'd like to add a sixth. The one that is probably, no, not probably, absolutely the most authentic. Who you are in the eyes of God. And what does it feel like then to be considered in God's view? Depending on how you understand God and how that has been shaped, the idea that God can truly see you could prompt a wide variety of emotions. But turning to Hagar's story, let's see how God's view of her is different from those around her. In this part of the saga, Abram and Sarai, Sarai is seeking to bring forth a child through her own means, not God's, and offers Hagar her slave as a surrogate and wife to Abram. Sarai's hope was that any child from that union could be claimed as her own, because such practices were common at that time. This points to the one power Hagar had over Sarai, even as a slave, her fertility. Yet she lacked autonomy over even that. Hagar had no say over whether she would be given to Abram, whether she would bear a child, or whether her child would ultimately be given to Sarai. Hagar's preferences and well-being were not given any consideration because the value placed on her by others was not in her person, but what could be gained by having and using her. The dismissal of personal value and stripping of inherent rights is unjust, and these actions eroded her personal sense of self-worth and identity. But we know Hagar's spirit was not entirely crushed. She had enough fight left to push back against her position. And scripture tells us that when Hagar discovered she was pregnant, she held Sarai in contempt. And it's unclear whether this stems from her perceived change in status as carrying Abram's child, or her fierce anger over Sarai sexually exploiting her for reproductive purposes. When Sarai sees this shift in Hagar, she blames Abram. But Abram brushes it off and reminds Sarai, Hagar's at her mercy, which ultimately leads to Hagar being badly mistreated. It's interesting to note that Sarai's oppression of Hagar is described using the same word as Egypt's oppression of Israel, which ultimately led to God's liberating intervention. This is a type of oppression that God will not overlook. Under the harsh treatment, Hagar reached her limit, and rather than submit, she rose up in the only way that she had left, and Hagar fled, and she had along the road leading back to Egypt. Perhaps she wished to return to her family, or at least the familiarity of her homeland. Regardless, it was a dangerous choice. Even with some provisions, a single pregnant woman alone in the desert wilderness was unlikely to survive such a journey. Did she cry out to the gods of her days in Egypt? Did she cry out to the god that she had come to know among the tents of Abram's household? Did she curse those who subjugated her? Could she even articulate 
her despair and needs. We know that God is near the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit, and that the Spirit of God helps us to pray even when we cannot find the words. So, spoilers. When she stopped at the spring to refresh herself, she discovered she was not alone because the angel of the Lord had come to her. And the first word out of the angel's mouth was her name. But the angel of the Lord had some unwelcome news for her. To her certain dismay, the angel told Hagar to return to Sarai. And this can be a problematic part of the story for us to hear, especially when we consider how it might be applied to current day situations of abuse. Why would God ask Hagar to return to her life of slavery? On a practical level, we can imagine that Hagar was likely facing death in the wilderness if she persisted. The angel does offer an explanation, and Hagar receives the first divine annunciation of a woman in the canon of a promised child and a promised dynasty. He gave her hope. Immediately following, Hagar expresses something simple yet profound. She says, you are El Roy, which translates to, you are the God who sees me. Hagar is the only person in our scriptures to give God a name in this way. As a slave who had been overlooked and seen as something to possess and use, the significance of being truly seen cannot be exaggerated. This encounter at the spring was a meeting of the lowly with the divine, and it is a meeting of familiarity, compassion, and hope. God heard her, saw her, came to her, and spoke a future and true identity over her, the one God had always been able to see an identity that would be known for hundreds of generations to come because we know her. Her culture saw her as a foreigner, a slave, usable, unworthy of protection, yet God saw her as significant, resilient, mother of a people and worthy of a promised future. Names and identity rooted in the world are often at war with those rooted in God The names we give ourselves and allow the world to give us can speak truth into our lives, but also speak lies. One of my favorite songs from the early 2000s was Voice of Truth by Casting Crowns. Remember that song? And it speaks to this exact issue. The chorus goes, but the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. The voice of truth says, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. Just as Hagar named God El Roy, the God who sees me, Casting Crowns names God Voice of Truth. These two names for God are powerful reminders to me of who God is and who I am in relation to him. Choosing to accept our identity as God sees, as Christ offers, can be difficult for us. Perhaps one of the ways we can live into that identity is to use specific names for God, such as the God who sees me in voice of truth, as we think about God. God has been given many names in scripture, and I'd like you to listen to a few of these and pay attention to what's going on inside you as you hear them. Which ones stand out to you? Which ones seem like a good fit for how you relate to God, or maybe wish you related to God? This is not an exhaustive list. God Almighty, the Most High God, the Everlasting God, the Lord will provide. The Lord is peace, the Lord your sanctifier, the Lord my shepherd, God of knowledge, the Ancient of Days, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, God the Father, Savior, Prince of Peace, Mighty to Save, God with us. Each of these names speaks to a particular part of our perception of God's identity. Some of these resonate with us deeply, and maybe there are other names that you like to use for God that bring comfort and a sense of understanding of who God is to you. Because we connect to God in personal ways, just as Hagar did when she spoke the name, the God who sees me. This identity is reflected in the name of her promised son, Ishmael, which means God heard. Clearly, when Hagar returned to camp, she told Abram of her experience and what the angel of the Lord told her. Everyone who met Ishmael, including Sarai, 
would be reminded of Hagar's miraculous encounter with the divine. When we realize that God sees us and we begin to live into that identity, our life will certainly change because we are living from an understanding that we are valuable in God's sight. The story of Hagar serves as a reminder that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit, that God knows the plans he has for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. While the world will seek to influence and perhaps even reject your identity, your identity in God is constant, clear, and secure. You are created by God, made in his image. You are known. You are chosen. You are beloved. You are sought. And you are seen. Truly seen.